Okay, hello everybody. My name is Randy and I am alcoholic. Hi, Randy. It's amazing to be in this room with all this energy of all you alcoholics and non-alcoholics that are here today. Um, thank you to Brad for inviting me out here for an amazing weekend so far. And uh, happy birthday to all the birthday people and welcome to all the newcomers. And I'm alcoholic. My body is allergic to alcohol. I can never ever drink alcohol successfully ever again, one day at a time forever, today. But that's not why I'm here today. I'm here today because I have a disease. And the disease they call it, they call that disease alcoholism, which is a strange thing because they have named the disease after the treatment for the disease. It's like calling diabetes insulinism. <laughs> it seems to me that if you take the alcohol out of the alcoholic, that I would get better. But that's not what happened. There was something wrong with me. I have a disease called alcoholism. Alcohol actually is the medicine that made it possible for me for 27 years to live on this planet. Alcohol did for me everything I ever wanted. Alcohol made me taller, smarter, faster, <coughs> gave me courage, made me a better dancer, made me funny. I think there's a lot of people that would argue about all of that, but when I was drunk, I was sure that I was smarter, faster, more courageous, and funnier. The reason I drank alcohol and the reason I became allergic to alcohol is because of my alcoholism. It's because of a disease that centers in my mind. And it's a disease that talks to me. And it's a disease that talks to me in my own voice. So I believe everything that it says because it's me. Why would I lie to me? That doesn't make any sense at all. And it manifests as an unsatisfiable, fault-finding, opinionated mind that's always in a hurry, easily frustrated, and can't stand the word no. If you say no to me, I'm pretty sure I asked the question wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I will rephrase that question over and over and over again until you either run out of my life screaming or you say yes, and then we'll all be happy. <laughs> so because of this mind, because I have an unsatisfiable, fault-finding, opinionated mind, that mind, and it's talking to me, and it's talking to me all the time, it talked to me this morning. It said, Randy, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna say at this meeting? We gotta think of something. And over and over and over again, it kept wanting me to rehearse something, come up with a story. You've got to protect yourself. This is terrifying. You're going to get up and talk in front of 200 people, and you, don't, you haven't practiced? <laughs> <laughs> when I came into the program, I had a drinking problem. I was sure of that. I crashed cars. I blacked out almost every single time I drank because whenever I started drinking, I never knew when I was going to stop. And pretty much the stopping probably happened after the blackout. That was the end of the drinking, and then it was the crazy behavior, and then I would wake up and try and figure out what the hell I did that day or that night or that week or whatever it was. Um, so I had a brother who was my drug dealer, and he got sober, and so that was, he thought maybe I had a problem too. <laughs> so he introduced me to AA and I went to a meditation meeting for every Tuesday night. I would go and meditate and I thought, hmm, I'm working a good program. And then I would go out and drink until next Tuesday and I'd come back and meditate again. <laughs> and I did that for like six weeks in the summer. I went back to LA, this is my drunk log. I went back to LA and I was, I was visiting a friend there, a girlfriend. And every day she would go to work and every day I was going to go out and see some friends and, and live my life and get out and, and I wasn't going to drink. And then around lunchtime I would say, mm, I'm just going to have a beer, just one beer today, just a beer. 
And then I was on the phone getting other stuff and drinking and, and using cocaine around the clock and watching the crack under the door because I'm sure somebody's coming to get me. <laughs> and my self-talking mind told me, this is a great vacation. <laughs> That's the end of my drinking and, and drugging. I came back, I got sober in Miami. I went to a meeting every day. It was a noon meeting and I met this guy. I was 27 years old when I got sober, so I've been sober a little while. And my sponsor was 52. He was this really old guy. <laughs> and I used to go have lunch with him every day after the meeting. and. Uh, one day I said to him, hey, you know what? When I'm 52, I'm gonna have 27 years of sobriety. And he says, no, you're not. <laughs> he didn't think I was gonna make it. <laughs> he was a lovely man, but he told the truth as he saw it, and that was one of his truths. I wasn't gonna make it. So I made it. He wasn't around at 52, and when I got there, I couldn't find him. But. So I came into the program and they taught me how to not drink one day at a time. Here's the trick to not getting drunk today. If I don't want to get drunk today, I can't take the first drink, no matter what. That's it. That's all the instructions there are for not drinking. If you don't want to get drunk today, you don't take the first drink. Now, for an alcoholic with alcoholism, for me, that's impossible. That is impossible because I have a mind. I have a fault-finding, opinionated, unsatisfiable mind. So my mind, I wake up in the morning and my mind says, Randy, you need a new car. And I go, hell yeah, that's a great idea. I need a new car, I'm gonna get a new car. And then I go to work and everyone else is working and I'm on the internet, because I need a new car. My mind told me I need a new car. It's obviously it's true, I need a new car. And so I'm shopping for cars, everyone else is working. Uh, I drive home on the freeway and I'm looking at cars. I'm not driving, I'm just looking at cars and I'm picking out cars and I'm deciding which car I'm gonna get. And you know, for six months, that's all I do is talk about cars and what color I want and what car I want. And I'm talking to myself and I'm, and I'm constantly obsessed with cars. And my mind's telling me, come on, let's go, let's buy the car. And I buy the car. That same mind, exactly the same voice, it says, Why'd you buy a car? <laughs> you don't need a new car. You have a car. Now you have a new car payment. You're an idiot. There's something wrong with you. My own mind, the same mind that told me I needed a car and was so excited about getting a car, is the mind that turns on me and tells me you're an idiot. And it does it with everything. I didn't know that was alcoholism. I thought that's just, I just I'm just, maybe I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, I, I don't know. But that's what my mind does. It does it with girls. I had a girlfriend, great. When I met this girl, she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And I was positive she was the one. And I tricked her into going out with me. I started a relationship with her. Two weeks later, that mind that told me how perfect she was and how happy I was going to be started telling me what's wrong with her. Starts finding fault with her. And now it's talking to me, I gotta get out of this relationship. The same mind that told me to stay in it, to find it, to get it. And then for six months I talked to myself about breaking up with her and I weigh all the pros and cons and I talk to myself incessantly. And then I break up with her. And that same mind about five minutes later says, oh my God, what an idiot you are. She's the best girl you're ever going to have. Why would you break up with her? You're such an idiot. This goes on all day. This is my mind. I wake up in the morning and it tells me I'm in the wrong job. It's the job that it told me was exactly the right job. And I'm married to the wrong woman and I have the wrong kid and I drive the wrong car. And it never shuts up and it never stops and it's alcoholism. And by the way, let me say this, I hope that you don't have what I have. <laughs> I hope that you were a heavy drinker and that you're able to stop drinking in your life and you live happily ever after and you find the right girl and you have the right amount of money in the bank all the time 
and that you have the right job and that you live in the right neighborhood and your mind doesn't talk to you like mine does. But I call that alcoholism because that is the reason I need to drink. It's because of the way that my mind talks to me. It gets me to be what the book says. These words are used so much, they're like meaningless, but I become, because of my mind, restless, irritable, and discontent. Discontent means unsatisfied. I didn't know that for years in the program. I was, my, my sponsor, my second sponsor, when I met him, he talked about an unsatisfied mind. I'd never heard that before in AA. Never heard it. I thought AA was for drinking. You go to AA to learn how to not drink, and you work the steps because you have a sponsor, and that's the chores you have to do. You have to do the steps to have the obsession to drink removed. And once the obsession to drink is removed, the disease is treated. And now I can get on with the business of getting the things that I think I should have because I'm sober, for God's sakes, and the world should give me all kinds of stuff because I'm being such a good boy. <laughs> So, when I first came into the program, I did the steps like a chore. I did step one. I admitted I'm powerless over alcohol, yes. And I admitted that my life was unmanageable. I had become unmanageable because of alcohol. I crashed cars, I trashed jobs, I couldn't stay in places to live. I had friends that, that uh, not many friends. I had a hostage. <laughs> I always had like one hostage, but I never had friends. Because a friend is a crazy thing. A friend, I thought friends were people that admired me and talked good about me and treated me like I was special. I thought, okay, you can be my friend. You, you treat me good. That's not what a friend is. A friend is somebody who treats other people good and, and treats others well and thinks good thoughts of others and tries to build up others. I didn't, I didn't want to be that guy. I wasn't interested in building you up. If you wanted to be my friend, you had to build me up. So hence, I didn't have a lot of friends. But I came in and I admitted that my life was unmanageable. It was my outside life. My cars, my money, my jobs, my everything was messed up when I got here because of alcohol. And then step two, we read and we talked and we read and we talked and I, we went into step two and in step two, I uh, he said, I didn't really believe in God, but I was sober now about six months. And that was impossible because I drank every day and I loved alcohol. And it was impossible that I wasn't drinking. So my sponsor asked me, am I willing to believe in a, that a power greater than myself exists? Are you just willing to believe? And I said, yes, I'm willing. I'm willing to believe that because I haven't drank. And then he said, okay, and we read some more stuff, and we talked, and we read, and we talked, and he said, okay, we're doing step three today. And uh, we got on our knees. I'd never done anything like that before, never. I got on my knees next to another man, and he held my hand, and we prayed. I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God that I had absolutely no understanding of, none, except that I hadn't drank. And I had no idea what my will in my life was that I was turning over. But my sponsor said, we're doing step three today, and I wanted to get through these 12 chores. So I said, yes, I'm in. And I did the prayer. And I did the rest of the steps like that, like a chore, and I checked them all off. And I made it through 12, and now it was, you know, go out and find a newcomer to to share all this amazing knowledge that I had. Well, at a year and a half of sobriety, I started, you know, the, that self-talking mind started talking to me loudly and it said, you know, you got a year and a half of sobriety, this job that you have right now, it's not really, it's below you. You need a better job. You should be making more money. And the girl I was dating, it said, oh, you know, she was good when you were new, but you need something better. It's time to upgrade. And so I became unsatisfied again, but I didn't know that's what was happening. I just became restless, irritable, and discontent. And to the point at two and a half years of sobriety, I had a job, I had a girlfriend, I had a place to live, but I hated my life. Just like I did before I got sober, I hated my life. I hated my parents, I hated where I lived, I hated everything about my life, 
And I had a fantastic life. If you looked at my life, you would have said, what's the matter with you? But I couldn't tell you, but there was something very wrong with me. So, at two and a half years of sobriety, I pretty much wanted to kill myself every day. I would go to this meeting. Uh, it was called Roxbury Men's Stag Meeting. Great meeting. Be like 150 guys every Wednesday night. You had to come a half an hour early if you wanted a chance at a seat. And we'd stand in line and everybody would be patting everybody on the back and everybody would be so excited and happy. And I was standing there and I was not happy. And I was not excited. And I, I didn't have any friends there because I have a problem with friends. And, uh, and they would all clap each other on the back. And, and, and after the meeting, they would always say, just don't drink today and you're a winner. And I would go home after that meeting and I would sit on my bed and I would weep. Because I was not a winner. My mind told me I was a loser. I'm two and a half years sobriety. This is my job. This is where I live. This is the car I'm driving. You're a loser. That's the way my mind talks to me. And then it says, nothing ever works out for you, Randy. Not even being sober. You should kill yourself. That's the way my mind talks to me. And so I knew I was in trouble and I went, I had a sponsor at the time, I went to that sponsor and I said, I have to have this higher power. How do I find this higher power? And he told me a story that I'd never heard before. He said, when I was nine years sober, I ran out of my house in my cowboy boots and my underwear and he climbed a mountain. And at the top of the mountain, his wife called the police when he ran out of the house. And they came and got him, he's nine years sober, they came and got him and they put him in a straitjacket and they took him to the place where they take people that are a little, have lost it. <laughs> I guess what you call that. <laughs> and he said on the way there, that's where he found his higher power. <laughs> My jaw hit the table. I thought that's a hell of a program. <laughs> I'm probably not going to make it to nine years and run around in cowboy boots and underwear. That just looks terrible on me. <laughs> and I thought, I'm, I'm in trouble. And, and I reached out to this thing they call a higher power and I said, God, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm dying here. I'm going to die. And I went to a meeting and I found this guy named Ted who saved my life. And he said, he said at the meeting, he says, alcoholism is an unsatisfied mind never heard that anything like that before and I pulled him over and he says he says don't take my word for it he says look at your own life so I had to look at my life and I looked at my life and I had a job it was a decent job it paid all my bills I didn't have any extra but it paid all my bills but it wasn't good enough for me I was unsatisfied I had a car it got me from A to B no problem it didn't break down it worked fine but it wasn't good enough for me. I was unsatisfied. And I could see that everywhere in my life I was unsatisfied. I was discontent. Because of alcoholism, because of this self-talking mind that talks to me in my own voice. And he says, okay, all right, so we're going back into the steps. And now we're going to do what it says in the book. We're going to live this in the beginning of the, of the 12 and 12. Hidden in the foreword where alcoholics will never read. Because we go right to the end, right? How does this end? That's all I care about. Get me to the end now. It says AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which if practiced as a way of life can expel my obsession to drink and enable me to become happily and usefully whole. All I ever wanted to do was be happily and usefully whole. One day I sat down and I thought about, why do I need money? Why do I need so much money in the bank? Why do I need so much money? Because my mind's always telling me how much money I need. I thought, why do I need so much money? And it came to me that if I had enough money, if I had the right amount of money in the bank, just the right amount, then my mind would shut up about money. And I wouldn't have to have that conversation all day. And if I had the perfect wife, if she was perfect, if I found the perfect one, 
then my mind would shut up about wives. And if I had the right job, would shut up about jobs. So what I really wanted was my mind to shut up. That's all I want. I just want to have a quiet mind. And now I go back into the first step, and the first step says I'm powerless over alcohol. Yes, I can never ever drink alcohol. I'm, I'm allergic to alcohol. It's an allergic substance. If I don't drink alcohol, it does not affect me. Not one bit. My life has become unmanageable. Today I'm 30, 40 years sober. My life, what goes on inside of me, that's my life. What goes on outside of me, that's my living. What goes on inside of me is my life. My life, my inner thought life is unmanageable by me. Still, with 34 years of sobriety, alcoholism does not get treated in time. I have a lot of time. I still have alcoholism. Alcoholism doesn't get treated at meetings. Meetings are important. I go to three, four, sometimes seven meetings a week. But meetings don't treat alcoholism. And time, meetings, and sponsors don't treat alcoholism. The only thing that treats alcoholism is a relationship with a higher power and 12 steps in application as a way of life. So the 12 steps says having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. If you ask me what the 12 steps should say, here's what I think it should say. It should say, now that I've been a good boy for 34 years <laughs> and I haven't drank and I've led a lot of meetings and I've sponsored a lot of guys for God's sakes. Can I please have everything that I want? <laughs> That's what I, the, the 12 step should say, now you've done all these chores for all this time, and you've been a good boy, now you get everything that you want, and go enjoy it. But it doesn't say that. It says having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I can't tell you. It's only recently that it dawned on me that the goal of the 12 steps is to have a spiritual awakening. It's not to have a better job. It's not to have more money in the bank. All those things happen if I stay sober. But that's not the goal of the 12 steps. It's to have a spiritual awakening. So, my life has become unmanageable by me. I cannot stop the thoughts that are going to come into my head. And at the end of the first step, it says, I stand ready to do anything which will lift my merciless obsession. We didn't ask, but I'm sure there's some new people in this room. And there's probably some people that aren't even sure they have alcoholism yet. My merciless obsession today, and always has been, to be self-satisfied. To have the thing, whatever the thing is that my mind tells me today is the thing that is the thing that if I had that, then I would be happy. If I only had Joey's farm, <laughs> how could I not be happy? If I had Joey's farm, I'd be the happiest alcoholic ever. Joey, you want to make me happy? <laughs> All I need is a farm, this one, then I'll be happy. My merciless obsession today is to be self-satisfied. When I don't get self-satisfied, I become restless, irritable, and discontent. And that's when the urge to drink gets stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm either going to drink or kill myself. Or I'm going to do the worst thing I ever have to do. To me, this was the, the worst or the hardest. I had to start coming to believe right now that there's a power and that that power is greater than me and that that power, the one that's greater than me is the power that's going to restore me to sanity. I have lost the job. I am no longer authorized to go to my mind and ask me what would make me happy. Because I'm the wrong power for that job. That's it. 
My wife, when I met her, well, before she was my wife, she was in the choir at a church. And so she asked me if I would go and listen to her sing. I'm not a church person. It's not my thing. Well, it wasn't my thing at the time, for sure. I was sober 10 years already. And uh, I said, yes, I'll go, <laughs> enthusiastically, because I like this woman and I want her to think I'm a nice guy, so I go. Inside, I'm going, for God's sakes, really? I gotta go to church? <laughs> this is a lot to ask. I hope this doesn't go on for a long time. <laughs> but I went to that church, and she sang, and it was beautiful. She was in the choir, so it was hard to hear her specifically, but it was fun to watch. But the preacher got up on stage, and he did his thing, and it's a very boisterous church. And he, I didn't hear a word he said, of course, because I was talking to myself about when... <laughs> When and if I should ask this woman to marry me, I was really busy with that conversation and the church things going on, just like some of you right now are very busy out there. You're very busy adding up how much money you got in the bank or what kind of car you drive or if you're going to ask this girl to marry you. I know you are because that's what I did. I would drive an hour and a half to a meeting to hear a guy speak and I would sit down and he'd start speaking and I'd be talking to myself so loud I wouldn't hear a word that was said. And I do this every Monday night. For years, I would go there and I'd say, tonight I'm listening. I couldn't listen. I couldn't hear a word he said. People would laugh, and I would laugh. Because, you know, I didn't want to look odd. They're laughing. I should probably be laughing. I had no idea what was funny. But I'd laugh, and they'd clap, and I'd clap. And at the end of the meeting, you could ask me anything. I didn't know one thing that was said in there. But this guy was talking on stage, and he says, he says, you know what the most commonly used name for God is? And I went, oh, oh, can't wait to hear this one. And then people in the audience all shout, it's Jesus, it's Buddha, it's Muhammad, it's Allah. It's... This was an open church, by the way. Uh, and they called out all these names, and, and he said, no, it's not Jesus, it's not Buddha, it's not Allah. He said, the most commonly used name for God is something. Something told me to get that girl's phone number. Something told me to take that job. Something told me to ask for help. Something told me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I asked something to help me today. Something, could you help me? I don't know what that thing is. I don't know if there's a God. I do not know if there's a God. But I know that something helps me stay sober today. And I know that if I rightly relate myself to that something, that I get a peace, I get a quiet, I get a calm. So the book says, true humility, this is the last line in the second step, true humility and an open mind can lead me to faith. An open mind is an open-mindedness. I thought I had an open mind. I told my sponsor, I have an open mind. If two gay people want to get married, that is perfectly okay with me. I'll have an open mind. He said, no, that's not an open mind. That's open-mindedness. But an open mind is a mind that's present, that's here, right here, right now in this room. And it's open to this moment being exactly the way this moment is supposed to be right now. It's open. No preconceived ideas. No old ideas. I think we read that somewhere in how it works have to let go of my old ideas, absolutely, all of them. Or the result is nil. The result of being at peace in this moment is nil. So it says, true humility and an open mind can lead me to faith. And every AA meeting, this is an AA meeting, is an assurance that God will restore me to sanity if I rightly relate myself to it. So going to a meeting does not make me more sober. It's good I go to a lot of meetings. I am not saying don't go to meetings. Go to a meeting every day if you can. But a meeting's not going to restore me to sanity. It doesn't say going to a meeting will restore me to sanity. It says every AA meeting is an assurance that God will restore me to sanity if I will rightly relate myself to it right now. right here. The only moment that I can have a relationship with my higher power is right here, right now. In this room.
I get to rightly relate myself to it. So I have, we have five, that clock is wrong. How long do I go till 11? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got more time to talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm gonna take two minutes right now and I'm gonna invite you all, all of you, to take two minutes and we'll, you don't have to do this by the way, don't get nervous. But I'm gonna invite you to rightly relate yourself to your higher power, whatever it is that you think that something is. I'll tell you how I do it. I talk to it like I would talk to a friend. I say, God, here I am, sitting on a stage, talking to a bunch of alcoholics. Could you take the fear out of me? The fear of being judged, the fear of failure, the fear of not being good enough. Could you be with me? Could you help me be the man that you would have me be, or the woman? Could you guide me and direct me? And I talk to my higher power like I would talk to a friend, and I tell it everything that's going on in my life right now, all my fears, all my hopes, all my challenges. And then it's gonna be two minutes, so Believe it or not, I know you have a lot of stuff to talk to him about, but you'll probably run out of things to say in a minute. So then take the next minute or however long you have left and just thank that thing, whatever it is. Just take a minute and thank it for everything that you do have in your life. And I'm gonna stop talking now for two minutes. about two minutes. Every time I do that, every time I stop and I rightly relate myself to my higher power, my mind gets quieter. I get a moment of peace, a moment of quiet. That's what I call sanity. I don't think sanity is making the right decisions all the time and not making mistakes. I'm going to do all that. I'm human. I'm never going to be perfect. But I can have a moment of peace in any moment because my higher power is with me wherever I go. And I can make conscious contact with my higher power in any moment that I will stop whatever it is I'm doing and saying and being in, inside and I will turn my attention to a higher power. In How It Works it says, we stand at the turning point. This is the turning point. The turning point isn't when I am deciding to get married or not, or take a job or not. This moment, at the end of this thought, 
This is the turning point. Right here, right now, I stand at the turning point. I have two options. I can ask God for his protection and care with complete abandon of self, of alcoholism, or I stand at the turning point and I ask my protection and care with complete abandon of God. And there's no half measures. That's what that is all about. For years, I thought no half measures meant you had to do the steps perfectly. There's no half measures. My sponsor used to yell at me. Half measures avail you nothing. Do the steps. What's the matter with you? I'm like, what? I'm trying. You know what it says and how it works? It says, uh, you might have to read it. It says, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then we take these certain steps. If you want what we have and you're willing to go to any length, I always thought that that meant any length, the biggest lengths, the most incredible lengths. If I want this and I'm willing to cut my left arm off to stay sober, I'm going to be able to stay sober because I'm willing to go to any length. And then some guy says, uh-uh, that's not what it says. It says if you're willing to go to any length, the smallest, tiniest bit of willingness, you could stay sober. If you just pick up a book, just pick up the big book, that might help you stay sober. Then if you want to go to a little more length, maybe you open it up. Maybe you read a sentence out of that book. Just go to any length to stay sober. Pick up the phone, call your sponsor. For God's sakes, how hard is it to call a sponsor? For me, it's a 12,000 pound phone. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. Forget it. It's too, I'd rather, well, I want the easier, softer way. I don't want to do any, I don't want to do anything. I want you to do the work for years. My sponsor was brilliant. He was a brilliant man. I could ask him any question and he knew the answer to it. He knew what page everything was on in the book. He knew how many words there were and how it works. That's the kind of guy he was. I think he was a little on the spectrum, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but he was brilliant. And I could always call him and ask him what to do. And so I would call him. And every time I'd call him, he'd say, have you talked to God about that? And I'd say, no, Ted, you got the answers. I know how smart you are. I'm calling you because you talk back to me and I get the answers. And I did that for years and I would trust and rely on Ted, my sponsor, to be my answer. The book says, in, in, in step nine, it says the most amazing thing. It says that if I do this all the way through step, halfway through step nine, it says, I'm going to intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. Well, I can tell you, everything baffles me. <laughs> what shirt do I wear to this meeting today? Baffles me. Is it going to be too hot for this shirt? Should I wear a different shirt? I don't know. Is green going to look good up on the stage? I don't know. Should I have breakfast or not have breakfast? Because if I eat breakfast, I might be too full to talk. But if I don't eat breakfast, I might get too hungry to talk. Everything is baffling to me. The program gives me the greatest gift on the planet. What could be better? I, intuit I get to intuitively know the answer to everything in the moment that I need it. And it's intuitive. I know the books. Believe me, I've read these books. I've practiced what it says in the books. I understand the words and the name and the order they're in. I, it all makes sense to me. I understand it. But if I'm not practicing it, I don't get it. I will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. It will be downloaded to me by something. Something is going to give me the right answer to everything in the moment that I need it, if I will rightly relate myself to that something. 
And so these steps go in order. We, we just did that experiment of rightly relating. I, I had, I know for me, I had a moment of peace after that experience. I had a moment of peace. When I have enough moments of peace, when I've rightly related myself enough to this power, I become qualified to make a decision. It's crazy. I'm now qualified to make a decision to either turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood Him. That's the way it says it in the book, as I understood Him. I do not understand God, but it is understood by me as an alcoholic with alcoholism, it is understood by me that if I will rightly relate myself to that power, I could be restored to sanity. So I'm going to turn my thoughts and my actions, my will and my life right now, I'm going to make a decision to turn my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over to the care of God as I understood them, because I really practiced something in step two and I've had an experience and it's mine. And you can't have mine. I can tell you about it. I can tell you how great my power is. I can tell you all about it. You can't have mine. I wish you could. I'd give it to you in a minute. You have to get your own. Everybody in AA has to get their own. It says, A, I'm alcoholic and I cannot manage my own life. Never going to be able to manage my own life today, ever again, ever. B, Probably no human power can relieve my alcoholism. You're a human power, and I'm a human power, and neither one of us can remove my alcoholism. But God could and would if it were sought. This is the only moment I could sought. Again, it's now, right now. So that's my experience with getting to a place in my life today, where I could have a moment of sanity, where I could enjoy this moment, and I could come, this is a miracle to me, that I know Brad, and that Brad knows Joey, and that Joey has the farm, and that Brad would invite me to come here, and that I would get to have this life, and come with another friend, and I have friends. I have people that I care about in my life. I have friends, real friends, and I have a wife, and I treat her pretty good. And I have a job and I treat them pretty good and they like having me. It's amazing. I have an incredibly beautiful life one moment at a time so long as I don't ask me. <laughs> if I ask me how I'm doing today, well, I look at somebody else, anybody else, and I judge myself against them and I'm not doing so good. I cannot ask me how I'm doing. I ask God, God, how am I doing today? How am I doing? Am I being the man that you would have me be? I appreciate you all so much. I'm so grateful that I have this life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. I could never have the life that I have without it. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day.